John's book was very instrumental in helping me to break the Scientology spell. And another one was a book called Birthface Messiah by Russell Miller. And Russell's here with us. I'd like to invite Russell to come up and uh, talk to us for a few minutes. Um, out of interest, when I got into Scientology in 1987, it coincided with the publication of Russell's book. And I was only a brand new Scientologist. And I was told, absolutely, under no circumstances, read this man's book. I didn't for over uh, 20 years, but now I did. So welcome, Russell. Welcome to Dublin Thank Island. You. Thank you. Thank you. So let's get straight into the nitty gritty. Did they come after you? <laughs> of course they did, yeah, of course they did. What did they do? Well, they did what they did to everybody else. I mean, they, they followed me every single day. Followed you? They, um, they, they found unsolved crimes and told the police that I was um, responsible for them. They Were you accused of murder at one point? Uh, murder, arson, yeah. all kinds of things. Um, so they'd find an unsolved crime and attribute it to you? Yeah, and then they'd call the cops and tell them that I did it. And then... Um, uh, for a long time, um, they just uh, fielded a, a whole lot of private detectives, all of them, all of whom were called Eugene Ingram, and they tracked down my friends uh, everywhere across the world, or in the United, United States, all over Britain, um, trying to find the dirt on me. Right. They sent a team of three men from Los Angeles to uh, Britain. They took a flat in Kensington, uh, in London and they pinched the garbage from my publisher every night, hoping to get an advanced copy of the manuscript. They talked their way into the offices of the Sunday Times newspaper where I was working. That's where you're working, yeah. Uh, and it just went on and on and on, like it was never going to end. So you were a, a respectable journalist at the time, and, you, and you're being treated like, like a criminal being investigated by the police almost, you know, exactly. it, it's, it's an incredible um, They, they wrote to my publisher saying that I was an unreliable person and that I'd been sued several times, all lies. I mean, I, I'd, I'd never been, un, until they came along, <laughs> I'd <never been> sued. <laughs> Me neither, actually. Yeah. <laughs> so. Once again, I mean, I want to thank you personally for, for your book because I can remember the moment almost when I kind of went, oh. It's all a con. And I think, I think I remember you saying when we were in Florida how um, when you were doing the researches, you, you kind of took a line from, um, from the Scientology version of Hubbard's life and investigated that. And every time you went to research it, you struck gold because you found out that it was completely lies. Yeah? The, well, the thing is about Hubbard that he was, I mean, he was a charlatan. He was a constant trickster. He was an inveterate liar. I mean, he couldn't stop himself lying. Now, the, the church recently sent out a little um, flyer saying that my book was based on a few interviews with disaffected Scientologists. I saw that, yeah. yeah. I, I can assure you that that is not the case. I mean, I, was, I recognized it was going to be a controversial book. I recognized I, I would probably get into trouble with it. And I, I did everything I could to make sure the research was absolutely solid. I found Hubbard's aunt in Helena. Yes. I found the house where he'd grown up in Helena. Uh, he, he didn't grow up on a, on a farm covering a quarter of the state of Montana. Um, and I went to the university uh, where he'd been, where he'd been a graduate. And I just did all of the legwork that you need to do for a book of this kind. It was absolutely solid. I got his, his war record, which is like that. And um, they claim it was the, what they call shipped it. That it was, to cover his real adventures uh, behind the lines in the five theatres of war, da 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 And I said, well, if this is the case, then why would his sheep dick war record have letters from tailors demanding payment for unpaid bills? <laughs> why would they have a report of a court of inquiry when he fired on Mexico by mistake? Yes. Why yeah. would they have another court of inquiry when he's fighting a mythical bat battle against Japanese submarines that nobody else could find? It, it just doesn't make any sense. And I remember... After the book was published, we did a live debate on television in Britain. And they, you know, the Church of Scientology fielded as they do, uh, articulate, nice looking people, you know, very plausible. And in the green room afterwards, I said, I said to this guy, I said, do you really believe, do you really, really believe that my book is full of bullshit? And he looked at me in the face, he said, I do. 
<laughs> what can you do? So despite all the evidence, all the documentary evidence, he thought your book was bullshit. Well, well one of my favourite stories, I was at a dinner party in LA and um, somebody said to me, what's the most incredible story you've heard this year? And I said, oh, it was that um, Scientology spent a quarter of a million dollars putting a, a robot-operated submarine off the coast of Oregon looking for the two submarines oh. that Hubbard had sunk. And curiously, one of the guests at the dinner party kind of looked down at the table and said, $400,000, not a quarter <laughs> million. And it was Stacy Young, Stacy Brooks. Uh -huh. She said, because it was me that commissioned it. It's oh a true story. And you go, well, why not go to Japan and check the records of the Imperial Japanese Navy and find out if they lost any submarines off the coast of Oregon? But the idea of, you know, the vast amount of territory, that you, you know, it's just stupid. Totally. I think you've got to comm be commended, both of you, for, for, the, for the, not only the amount of research, but the way in which you conducted your research and, and, and fact-checked, to use a, a fairly modern term, everything. Mm. Now, I do that now these days, and the internet is a massive help when you do that. Um, yesterday, we took a few questions um, from people online in New Zealand and places uh, and asked John and one of them I want to ask you could you see your book ever being turned into a film <laughs> well it's been done I mean oh all uh, right well the master was yeah uh, exactly was the right film. okay okay um, good. we just didn't get paid anything okay I mean the, the difficulty is of course that um, you know people are very cherry of doing it I mean the media are very cherry of doing anything about Scientology because they always, always would be sued and so newspapers at, at home don't really want to cover Scientology because it's just too much trouble. Yes, and um, yes. you know, when my book was published, um, they sued me in the High Court, and they, they asked to go to the Court of Appeal, which they went to the Court of Appeal. They then asked, for, they lost in both cases. They then asked for appeal to uh, take it to the House of Lords and were refused. They sued me in Canada, they sued me in South Africa, they sued me in Australia. And in all of those countries we won in the end, but we did not win in the United States because in the United States, a, a ferocious litigant with access to unlimited sums of money can keep the case going forever. The, the, the Church of Scientology offered a, a million dollars to buy my book from my publisher. My publisher rightly and honorably refused it. But in the end, after about three years of litigation, uh, my publisher said, look, we just can't go on because the insurance company are going mad because of the escalating costs. And the book, while it's a you know, perfectly respectable and fine book, is never going to be a you know, huge bestseller. And they're never going to make a huge amount of money out of it. So they, they pulled out, and the book was never published in the United States, apart from a number of copies got out to libraries right. and, um, and other institutions, and they were immediately stolen by... Stolen by Scientologists, yeah. Possibly yeah, by yeah. members of the church, who knows? Well, I can say something about that. The, um, the Librarian, which is the magazine of British libraries, pointed out that my book was the most stolen book in history. <laughs> in the first yeah. year that the book was published, um, Portland Library in Oregon had nine copies stolen, and the uh, Miami Library, no, Tampa Library, had six copies stolen. There were 200 copies in British libraries. I believe there's not a single copy left. Yeah, we have a similar thing happening in Ireland with copies of The Complex, written by John Dagnan. I uh, was fortunate enough to buy what's known as the remainder when his publisher went bust, which basically means what books are left. And I was able to get um, quite a lot of copies of the complex. So I immediately started on a program of contacting each, each central library in the county and saying, we have these books, would you like so many? And they all said yes. Then I'd ask them, well, how many libraries do you have? And they would say 25 or 12. And I said, great, I'll get the books to you. And I think we worked on that for a while, didn't we? Mm -hmm. um, we can claim, uh, well, we don't claim 100%, but we got most of the libraries in Ireland the to take yeah. the complex. Now, the Scientologists worldwide are claiming that all the basic books are in libraries. Mm -hmm. And if you go checking, and you can even check online, you don't need to go to each individual, individual library. They're not there. Mm -hmm. they, so... They've taken all this money from people to put books in libraries and they're not there. So I don't know. There was a policy of actually putting Scientology books into the reference section, uh -huh. meaning where you wouldn't see them. Okay, there's one library in Ireland and it's a Trinity College, which is just down the road, and they have to have a copy of every book that's published. So maybe they might be there. I don't know. We'd need to check on that. Um, so 
It, it's incredible to think that these people that are preaching to others how they should live their lives and they call themselves the most, most ethical people on the planet would steal books from libraries to prevent people from getting information. Well, they may have just made the books evaporate using their own Oh, maybe they did that, yeah. Who, who knows? So, uh, what, at this stage, Russell, looking back on it all, do you feel that it was actually worth it? Oh, yeah. Blimey, Good. I certainly Good. Think it was worth it, yeah. Because, I mean, Hubbard needed to be exposed. And, um, yeah. uh, you know, the, he, he was an astonishing man. I mean, absolutely astonishing man. I'm full of admiration for him in, in one level. But on the other, of course, I, I despise him because I think he's a disgusting individual. Mm -hmm. He, um, I mean, I looked at all of the press cuttings and um, every time he was interviewed there were, he would always there'd be another story like he was recently um, a top sergeant in the marines or he was a, a crooner or he was a, a screenwriter in los angeles i mean he, he he couldn't help but make up stuff all the time even in his own diary when he was a kid he said things like oh well you never guess i was born on friday the 13th he wasn't he was born on a wednesday <laughs> he, but in, um, the, in the diaries there are three of the diaries that we, we have and one of them is actually a rewrite. He's actually rewriting his own diary to make it sound better. So there are two handwritten ones, and then there's a type-up of one of them improving on, on it. Yeah, I, I have to say, and I'm, I'm, I'm being quite open here, when I first read your book, because it, for me it was like a, a waking up moment, I was actually pretty angry at the stuff I was reading because I was beginning to realise that it was a calm and that 21 years of my life I believed the bullshit and now it was falling away. The second time I got to read your book, I actually could not stop laughing. Because <laughs> Hubbard, you yes. You tone. Well, thank you. <laughs> but he had all these things, like, that, like he couldn't stop lying. It's so true. But what came across was, was the comedy element of his life. Every decision he took was to solve a problem that he'd previously created. You yeah. know? And I'm sure on one level you must have had a lot of fun researching. Because it was fun because um, you, know, you kept come up, come, coming up with these facts which were directly in opposition to what, what was yeah. being claimed by the church. And, and John mentioned earlier, you know, when he was trying to get a pension from the VA, I mean, course, it, it was yeah. comical, you know, limping into these um, offices, pretending he's been blinded by this, that and the other. And um, you know, everybody that came across him and all came away with different stories. So um, yeah, he was yeah. just, you know, extraordinary. Did you cover him. the story where he was at a dinner party one time and he, and he got up and went, oh, 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 and then dropped a piece of shrapnel onto the table <laughs> and said, oh, that's always happening. Yeah. Was, that, was that in your book? Yeah. Yeah. All right, yeah. okay, yeah. 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 So, I mean, the other thing you have to ask yourself is that um, if, you, if you accept the premise that the book is correct, mm. and by the way, um, in every court that I was sued, no one ever, ever suggested anything was wrong. Wow. You know, they, they never said, look, we want to stop this book because it's full of lies. Mm. They said, we want to stop this book because of technical problems, it's breaching of copyright, breaching of confidence, all those things. And I was sitting in the, in the High Court in London thinking, why doesn't anybody say why they want to stop this book? <laughs> well, because it's a damaging book to the Church of Scientology. But the other thing is, you think, well, if you, if you bother to read the book, how can anybody take Scientology seriously after, yeah, after yeah. learning this about the founder of this so-called church? How can anybody take it seriously when you know yeah. what kind of guy he was? And I think that's why they see it as a danger. And also, I think something that Mark Headley said in the film, how you get a lawyer hiring a lawyer, hiring private investigators, hiring private investigators, and, and muddying the trail back. So I, obviously, like you were being sued by them, I guess. I don't know, were you? Or yeah, did they did, did they hide well, well, the no, trail? No, no, it was always the church that I'm sued me. Okay, okay. And the so. whole whole thing of private investigators, um, I remember you calling me up, and you, I think you did an article in China, and you did another article in Mexico, and there were people meeting you at the airport. There were private detectives. I had a Eugene Ingram, who's the name of all of the private detectives who followed us. He actually travelled all around the world collecting information on me. He turned up in Australia to talk to my girlfriend from when I was 19. And I started getting calls from people all over the world that I haven't heard from for years saying, this awful man came out. He actually he went and visited my parents, who were then in their 70s, and um, he walked around their house first. You know, it's a private detached house. He, he went and had a walk around. And they were growing tomatoes, which they <laughs> tended to do. And he said, oh, I see you're growing cannabis. <laughs> Charming man. 
Oh my! I, I actually tracked Eugene or one of the Eugenes down once because he called on a neighbour in London and um, and the neighbour found out where he's staying. Okay. So I called him in his hotel and I said, um, "Are you Eugene Ingram?" And he said, "Yes, I am." I said, "Well, uh, I'm Russell Miller. I understand you're asking questions about me." And he said, "Yes, I am." So I said, "Fine. You know, what do you want to know? Here I am. <laughs> Ask away." So he said, um, "Well, I'm trying to prove." And I think I can prove that you murdered Dean Reed. In <laughs> now, just a little bit of Whoa. background here. Yeah. Dean Reed was an American um, defector. He had crossed over to the communist world, um, and he was a quite a well-known singer and, and uh, film star in East, in the East. I happened to be in Berlin on the weekend that Dean Reed killed himself. Right. That was a complete coincidence. I that didn't prove it, doesn't it, Russell? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, what was what was freaked me out a bit is they that Eugene Ingram said, "I know your wife was born in East Germany, and she was," mm. and he said, "You were in East Berlin. Your wife was born in East Ber in East Germany. Uh, Dean Reed died in mysterious circumstances. So you know, it, it follows." that you're almost certainly responsible for the murder. Mm -hmm. If he's not, it's, if you're working for MI6 or the Stasi or the FC, FG, F, um, FSB. KSB or whoever, um, uh, so, you know, I'm going to prove it. Uh, did you know who Dean Reed was when he I said did, yeah, this? I oh, oh, okay. I had okay. made arrangements to see him. I took his agent just, but when I got to East Berlin after a lot of difficulty, it was difficult to get in those days, um, uh, by the time, uh, you know, I... I was ready to interview him, he'd actually walked into a lake the day before, for some reason best known to himself. But I, I didn't kill him, I didn't think anybody else did. He, he, he you didn't suicide. ask him to walk into the lake then? <laughs> no, no, well. You um, um, team powers. Um, just yesterday, or was it the day before, we had the, um, the local Scientology crowd send out a press release, and I believe you were mentioned in the press release. Um, and was John mentioned in the press release yeah, as well? The most recent one, yes. He was, okay. Um, does anyone remember exactly what lies were put forward there? I mean, are, are they repeating any of the stuff about Russell? Because I, I seem to remember that you were criticised, your research methods were criticised. They, they said, uh, they, they brought up this BBC lady called Margaret Percy, who apparently years ago said my research was seriously flawed. Um, I would never met this lady, and I'd like to meet her to I find did. out. Okay. Oh, you know her? Okay. Yeah, Margaret Percy made a, a Radio 4 documentary about Hubbard, and um, I got into some difficulty. I, I was the researcher on this and they broadcast it. it it's actually topical. The, the film we've just watched, there's an error in it. It's a, a small error, but I'd like to correct it. The film says that L. Ron Hubbard was in US Navy intelligence. Now, Russell and I can tell you that L. Ron Hubbard was never in US Navy intelligence. He was an intelligence officer, which means that he censored mail and he showed um, tro troops how to identify planes and ships. Oh. It doesn't mean that he worked for US Navy intelligence. It's something he put about. But Margaret Percy, in that document, her documentary, decided he was. And she pushed that deception forward. Right. I must say that, that she was an extraordinarily paranoid human being. Yeah. When I complained, and I had a, a letter printed in Radio Times complaining about the errors in their programme, um, I also phoned up the producer of the programme and he said, you know, you're, John, you're wrong about these Scientologists. Some of them are really nice people. Now, I not said that. And I said, oh, yeah, like who? And he said, oh, I go to a jazz club. And he said, I met this wonderful Scientologist there. And I said, what's he called? And he said, Peter Stumkey. And I said, he's the head of harassment in the UK. <laughs> and a good jazz musician? Or? Brilliant. <laughs> yeah. well, I think the thing they, they put out, I think, I think I'm right in saying that uh, that comparing my book, which had been just uh, the result of a few interviews with um, yeah. disaffected Scientologists, he said it was, it was like writing a biography of Hitler, which uh, there was an interesting analogy, um, <laughs> yeah, and only interviewing anti-Nazis. Now, um, yeah, you know, yeah, interviews of pro-Nazis. I actually, I actually think they used that one in, in the press release this week. Yeah. So they're regurgitating the same old crap, basically. Yeah. I, I thought you know, it was very yeah. comparable to writing a biography of Hitler. Yeah, it was very similar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I worked yeah. with Russell on on his book. I interviewed 150 people wow. uh, who were not necessarily disaffected Scientologists. Russell then went on and added, I don't know, probably about 50 more to that. So between us, we covered a lot of ground. 
I think as well, this is like a personal note again. Um, you, you pointed out that there was a, f a mistake in the film. Mm. I am a bit of a Nazi myself when it comes to mistakes and errors in well, what people pedant. say. There's no need oh. to be a Nazi, you know, really. Yeah. I, I, can be a, I can be a Nazi. I'd um, rather you were. For the simple reason that if somebody believes something that's factual or to be factual that isn't and tells somebody else, so they then go along and say, oh, well, did you hear this happened in such a time and this, and if it's wrong, then we've got all these people going along believing something that isn't accurate. Well, so this is why your books are fantastic well, on and, the subject. And we had to fact check down to the finest detail. Without the internet. Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, I mean, and the internet, you know, can go the wrong way. It can. You know, people yeah, tell me, yeah. I just researched a subject, and you go, you just read what some raving lunatic has said on the internet. Uh -huh. This is not research. So, and I think now, um, when I republished Blue Sky, um, I asked, we have it, Russell. I asked people to um, write puff pieces, and Arnie Lerma said, before the internet and before safety and numbers, there was John Atak. <laughs> and it was like that. Yeah, we, we, had to, we had real documents. You know, Margaret we didn't Percy have that. I know, I think it, this interview in a bar with your church, I right? got the wrong man. Uh, church, <laughs> oh, right, right, right. Okay. <laughs> It's, well, still, it's still made sense. It's, it's, a, it's a bloody cheek, actually, because um, you know, they should have followed me two years on the road, you know, tracking these people down. Yeah. That's, that's um, you know, the, the disaffected Scientologists, I would have interviewed Scientologists if they me, but they, you know, they weren't interested. That still applies today. You cannot speak to a member of the Church of Scientology. I got an email from a student journalist last night who said... She'd been considering doing something about Scientology and she wanted to speak to some existing members. You can't. Yeah, right. yeah. You just can't. But, but, Imagine but, being part of a religion where you can't talk about your religion. I mean, does that even make any sense to anybody? But we did interview people who still loved Hubbard. We did, you know, like Ray and Pam Kemp. Right. And, and took what they had to say into account as well. So it, it wasn't a matter of bias in that way. But no, we didn't really have access to no, so no. Itself. they have a PR person to deal with media inquiries. Uh, I've even seen it where um, a student journalist again knocked on the door and, and said, oh, can I talk to you? No, 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 you need to speak to our PR person. So I, I don't know. If, if you asked a Christian what they believed, and obviously if it wasn't inconvenient, I'm sure they'd answer the question and talk about that. You can beliefs. write to Freedom Magazine. You can, can't you? And they will answer yeah, the question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That was a pretty interesting... Are you a robot? Yeah. i tell you what I thought was sad, uh, Peter, is that um, when these uh, disaffected Scientologists were telling me about the extraordinary things that they'd been mm. made to do, and I'd be sitting there with my mouth open, and I'd say to them, you, why did you do that? Why could you possibly allow yourself to be treated that way? And they'd look at me, and they'd shake their heads, and they'd say, I don't know. Wow. I was well, always tremendously moved by that. There are answers to that question here. Take back your life. Um, there are standard psychological mechanisms that function. And as I said yesterday, learned helplessness is one. Yeah. And yeah. people just, you become used to being part of a system. In, in looking at Nazis, as they seem to be coming up in the conversation a lot, <laughs> uh, when Hannah Arendt... Sorry, German guys. <laughs> yeah, we, we don't mean you. <laughs> that, that, how was it that a whole nation... You know, what was it, 93% of people in Germany voted to abolish voting, to, to get rid of democracy, and 93%. And you go, well, they were, there were people holding guns there. No, there weren't. A group of people is quite capable of doing something yeah. atrocious. So and when you feel that belonging... And especially if you're, you're threatened that you're going to lose your immortality. Well, that's what Scientology you know. threatens you with. Yeah. So you stay there and you keep yeah, doing it. Of course, of course. Well, I'm hoping that what we're dealing with in this conference is the truth. Um, but of course, you could even argue what's the truth, I guess, you know? Yeah, let's do that for an hour. <laughs> no, let's not. Are we really here? <laughs> yeah. Is that purple yet? Yeah. It is in my mind. <laughs> Um, but I don't, for me, it's important to, to get facts right. And for me too, yeah. It's, it's, it's the facts that you two guys put in your book that really broke the spell for me. So I, I would certainly recommend your books to anyone, even who, who doesn't know anything about the subject. You'll certainly learn 
something about it from... Um, and would you like to give us your credit card details? A, sure, a, yeah. A yeah. rollicking good read. A, a rollicking, rollicking good read. read. That's, that's a good one. Would anyone like to ask uh, Russell any questions? Hundreds. Uh, I have a question. Um, yes, sir. Now, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, when I first blew the York, 30 odd years ago, I mean, nobody would stand up and speak like this. I mean, it was almost unheard of. Um, however, over the last decade or so with the internet, more and more information has been released and leaked up to the public. And the general knowledge and acceptance of the general amount of people who read these stories, I mean, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of damning stories pouring out now every week. You go on the internet, you go on Facebook, you go on YouTube, I mean, story after story after story, your books, yeah. your book, Nancy's book. I mean, it's, it's all coming out, it's pouring out, right? And yet the government still ignore the damage and still allow these organizations to have tax free credits and still don't step in with all this damning information, right, and do anything about it. Why do you think that is? All right. Okay. Somebody, uh, I, mean, I just want to get your take well, on it. Right? Yeah, I, I think the thing what Russell said about pub, the, the media being intimidated, uh, and part of it's just like when I was trying to get uh, Bluesco published, I, I approached 50 publishers, and 11 of them came back and said, we'd like to publish this book, but we're not going to. And one of them was the guy who pub published um, Cyril Vosper's Mindbenders. Okay. He was, you know, a, a guy in a suit, 70 years old, lovely guy, who said basically there's no money in a book about Scientology. He signed himself off, Death to the Evil Cult, which was quite interesting. But it's that whole thing. On the one end, there's no money to be made. On the other end, are they going to count the scotch bottles in my trash? Are they going to come after me? There is this sense, I mean, the film we've, this fine film we've just seen, shows that the intelligence agency is collecting information all the time, which can be used as blackmail. That's right. Yeah. You then have judges. You have Judge Ritchie, whose dog was drowned. I mean, killing pets is a standard aspect of Guardian's office behavior. My lawyer had her, somebody went into a garden and killed her pet rabbit. Probably not a Scientologist, you know. Um, you do things to undermine people, and in the end, with most people, they're going, why am I doing this? Why am I bothering to do this? And with politicians, your problem is always the same thing. Am I going to get re-elected? Will this get me re-elected? You know, are we going to change, you know, are we going to have a harm reduction policy towards drugs? Are we going to keep pretending and making the problem worse? Well, I might not get re-elected if I suggest that drugs should be decriminalised. Politicians are aware of that, very sadly. It's very short term. So it's only when you, you have, if you can persuade a politician that, you know, yeah, you're going to get re-elected, if you say, you know, there should be rules about counselling. If you say that, you know, I'm not for banning Scientology, I think that's a silly idea. But if you say, well, to be a therapist, you need to have a qualification. You need um, to have some kind of monitoring of what you're doing which seems a really good idea, and it was pro first proposed in Britain in the 1970s, I think, and we're still waiting for a government to regulate counselling in any way. So it's just that it's a very slow process, and there are all sorts of pressures yeah. from the cult as well. The quote that, sorry, comes to mind for me, yeah. sorry, quickly, the quote that comes to mind for me about the whole thing is when Hubbard said that somebody someday will say this is illegal, mm -hmm. and I really hope that day is getting closer and closer and closer, because... There are laws being contravened all the time, and we do want the authorities to sit up and take notice. Russia's doing it. France has done it. Thank you, France. Uh, Germany, Germany knew how to, to deal with the problem. Um, so, so there is a lot of good things happening, I, I think. No, no. The few facts about the books of these two gentlemen there is in Paris, for example, there are books of these two gentlemen in in the department store, and they, they never stay longer because they, they were stolen. Yeah. They were <laughs> stolen by, well, I don't know who. The most ethical <laughs> group on the planet. Yeah. And also that the stocks, when well, the, the book was on sale in the, in the 90s, uh, they disappeared. The, the stock went uh, they, they were buying. Russell, they were buying your books. They were. In, in lots. So. They were, they <laughs> <laughs> if they'd like to do that, that's yeah. fine, by the way. Yeah. 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 And the last fight, the last fight, that would be the, the end of my intervention, they were even looking in the second hand shop 
ze gaan naar de ze gaan naar de bookshop. If they can find any of your copies, and they were surrounding all of them. And we get the facts because I, I know a, a lady, she's working in Sagan Hamshell, and she said, Oh, I got a visit. Do you have any uh, uh, Scientology talking, uh, books, uh, critics about uh, Scientology? She said, No, I don't have any. Oh, if you got a, any copy, please keep one for me. Uh -huh. That's, <laughs> very That's great. Right yeah. Uh, early in 20, uh, 2000, they were so scared. Nowadays, well, Maybe it could be a good opportunity to reprint in Italian. Huh? Uh, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that. Reprint. Maybe it could be a good opportunity to print it again. But, well, actually, um, the, the, the entire book is on the internet. Um, you know, if you. When, when, um, when, it, when I realized it wasn't going to be published in the United States, I said, right, to hell with it. You know, we put the book on the internet and all the research. Um, so if you, if you want to, to know, you know, how, they, how this. These facts materialize. It's all there. Many of the interviews yeah. are actually posted. Yes. Yeah, and we, so and the book has been republished. Can I just say we have it on exscientologistisland.net as well, which is the but, page but for this the conference. Buy the hard copy of the book. But buy the hard copy. Yeah. Pay us something. Yeah. The, there's a, there's a gentleman yeah. at the back that's got a question. Yeah, I'd like to put a question. I, I don't mean to come across with any degree of arrogance, but I'm addressing it to either or all of you, in fact. And what I can't understand about this guy is how he got away with it. I mean, if you all watch the movies, the snake skin oil man coming into town on the stage coach, right? And, you know, I remember in the early 70s up here in the middle of Abbey Street, the kind of vague looking sign of this book, Dianetics, and then I was approached in London on occasions by earnest looking guys. I wouldn't be remotely interested. And because I'd be thinking about the snake skin oil salesman getting off the stage cognition. And America's always been that way, in a certain kind of way. It is even that way with fundamentalist Christian religions, with Billy Graham. To this day, with respect to the Americans, it's a sense of naivety. Would Ron L. Hubbard have succeeded in Europe? I don't think so because, first of all, there's a, a multitude of languages. Sure. I don't think it would be the good launching pad for him. Mm -hmm. Obviously, then he's able to get into Europe afterwards, like McDonald's, like any of the corporations. So generally, the question I'm asking is, what type of individual, what is it, how does he get you? Is there a profile of the type of individual that's got no. Okay. No, there isn't. Um, the, the first stage of involvement in, in any cult is, is dislocation of some sort. So you move to a new area, you go to a new school, your marriage breaks down, you have a new partner. Any sort of change makes you open. And so you're looking for new friends, what have you. I mean, I'm going to make a, an invidious comparison about Europe as opposed to America. And that is, you know, how could anybody believe in Hitler? How could anybody believe in Stalin? How could anybody believe in Pol Pot? And the point is that masses of people did. Germany believed in Hitler, but I don't think Europe believed Well, Italy, Mussolini, uh, Spain, Franco at the same time, Mosley in England at the same time. I agree. It was a fact. It was a way of fascism. Yeah. But it was probably because the Pope, because capitalism didn't seem to be working out. Well, yeah, but, but it's exactly that. There was a dislocation of a whole population who are economically having difficulty. If you look at France during that period in the Pétain government, fascism in, in France, that they were handing over Jews. You know, only the, only the Danes didn't. So I think you've got the group dynamic, which is that we're a lot less clever than we like to think we are. But you've also got this thing of you're in a strange place and somebody, smiling person comes up to you, attractive smiling person, and says, how are you doing? What's going on? And you start talking with them and they invite you to come and have a free personality test. If you've not been proofed up against this, if you don't realize that you, you know, there is no such thing as a free, a free personality test, yeah. then you'll go along. And it's then stages of dissonance where you accept more and more and more and more goes wrong. And one day you find yourself marching in the Waffen SS, you know. <laughs> how do you think he gets away, he got away with it, Russell? 
I think he got away with it because he was charismatic. Right. Um, I think it was uh, you know, before we were aware of cults, um, before um, you know, the people became aware of the way that cults operated by, as John says, you know, disconnecting you from your friends and, and stuff. So I think, um, I think the time was right for him. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. I think uh, he, had, he had the right contacts. Um, and he had the, you know, he was a bully. He, he sort of intimidated people. Sure. And um, uh, so, you know, he, he was frightened of nothing. Well, he essentially played on people's insecurities. Say that again, please. Well, he plays on people's insecurities. To a point, I think. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> I think we're pretty, I think if we can call this the information age, the information to some degree inoculates us but there can still be victims for the reasons John mentioned. Well, no, let's make it clear. Cults are a bigger business now than they've ever been. Do you think so? The, I know so. So the information does two, not inoculate yeah, people. 20 years ago when I was in the States, 2,000 groups were listed as dangerous cults. There are now 5,000 groups on that list, wow, and okay. many of them use the internet to recruit, and you will never meet anybody. And I've, I've talked with parents of people whose children have disconnected from them because they've joined some philosophical group which now dictates right. their life. Well, let's limit what we're doing to Scientology, okay? Otherwise, we could be here well, for... No, it, it, yeah. if the point is how it's no, but seriously, yeah. Yeah. the other point is that, you know, as Margaret Singer pointed out in her Cults in Our Midst, we live in a cultic society. Yes. If you look at the advertising campaigns used by politicians since... Sachi and Sachi were hired by Margaret Thatcher. She, yes. You see incredible manipulation. These people are understanding how to get to you emotionally beneath your reasoning. So we're living in that place. It's not just Scientology, it's everywhere. And it's not because of something that these groups do to us, it's because we collaborate with them. And that's the thing we can learn how not to do, but you have to learn it. You can't just say, I'm invulnerable. Because I tell you, the first person to be recruited is the one who says, <laughs> I'm involved. <laughs> Give me five minutes with them. Yeah, I totally agree. There's an old adage that um, the best, vic- the, best the, the, the most uh, vulnerable person to a salesman is a good salesman. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You can yeah. sell anything to a salesman. Yeah, yeah. I agree with you there. Thank you. Guys, uh, any more questions? Okay, I'd like to thank both of you for coming up here and for writing those books. But thanks to the internet, you can be.